everybody, and welcome, welcome back. Uh, thanks for joining us here today, uh, which is uh, well, webinar 12. You are watching Insider Guides Industry Webinars, where we take a deep dive into different parts of the international education sector and really the future of education in general. Thanks for joining us on this journey. We've been doing this uh, almost weekly uh, for about 12, 13 weeks now, ever since lockdown started. So uh, we, we, we're very uh, grateful to have you here. My name is James Martin. I'm the Managing Director of Insider Guides, where we uh, prepare, welcome, and support international students across the all stages of their journey, right from research right through to graduation. Uh, and um, yeah, it's, it's fantastic to have you here. At the moment, we're helping international students just understand and navigate what's happening at the moment, and there is a lot going on. And we're also working with organizations that want to talk to international students uh, in various ways as well. Um, if you've missed any of the past webinars, you can head to insiderguides.com.au forward slash webinars and, and view all of them there. And, uh, and by the way, we're also running student webinars now. So if you have any, in, any international students that are looking to get a job or understand uh, resources such as ment mental health resources or, or um, those sorts of topics, every week, every Wednesday, we're interviewing experts right across the international education field to really help international students and really get through this and, and set themselves up uh, for a better student experience. Uh, well, here we are as we move through this pandemic and international education becomes a trickier concept to grasp, let alone manage and market. Uh, it's a good time to assess how various parts of the sector have responded and evolved. And over the past few, year, few weeks, we have spoken to vice chancellors at universities, thought leaders in higher education, the vet sector, government, as well as all the peak bodies but this week, we turn our attention to the important school sector, which has a whole set of different challenges. I'd like to welcome back my uh, co-host, Rob Lawrence, who has been a source of wisdom and experience over recent months as we delve into some of the challenging issues and future considerations across the international education sector. Rob is an internationally renowned researcher and strategist who possesses extensive credentials across all levels of education. Thanks for joining us again today, Rob. Great pleasure, enjoying them. Great, I'm enjoying them too actually. Very, it's great and we're really having, having a great time here. I'd also like to welcome our special guest today, Derek Scott. Derek joined Halebury in 2002 as head of senior school between 2005 and 2007 and was appointed principal in 2007. He is the director of Halebury International and chairman of the Halebury International School in China. Derek is also on the board of the IAA and is on the federal government's Ministerial Advisory Council for International Education. Halebury is one of the leading independent schools in the Asia Pacific region with multiple campuses in Victoria, including Melbourne's first vertical, uh, vertical school and campuses in Darwin and Beijing. With over 125 years of history, Halebury has changed dramatically with a mission to develop high achieving students connected globally to each other and to the communities in which they live and which they will serve. It is one of the most entrepreneurial and enterprising schools in Australia, and we're interested to explore their response to COVID-19 and the future outlook. Derek, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, James. Thank you, Rob, and uh, welcome everyone. Well, um, this is a Zoom webinar. You have the ability to ask a question. Please do that. Uh, it's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll also launch a poll uh, midway through this. We'd love to get your thoughts on some of the topics that are surrounding this, this the situation we now find ourselves in. At the end of this webinar, you'll receive a short survey. Please uh, do let us know how you found it. And uh, if you missed this one or you have a colleague that might be interested, all of these webinars are recorded and they'll be up on YouTube. So please, uh, we'll then send this, this link to you and feel free to share it around. All right, without further ado, Rob, take it away. Derek, thank you so much for joining us today. I feel very privileged to be talking to you personally. So, um, you know, it's uh, great, great fun, these things. And I also feel um, that the schools do need to be properly represented. So who better? Yeah, um, thank you. Derek, we don't see many headlines though about the schools. Um, you know, we do about universities and so on. From where I'm sitting, schools are appearing to be experiencing really unheralded daily issues. Um, I, I hear in the, even the local community where I live about hardship fee deferral requests, Challenges transition to online, newly arrived students quarantine in boarding houses, and generally the demise, the whole demise of the experience, the school experience, sports, 
extracurricular study tours, festivals, events, you know, the memories which we take away from school. And then I also think about the impact on staff and a lot of people have said that, that on, on the media that the staff, the real heroes have also been the teachers. So it must be a nightmare for schools to manage on every front, especially if so many schools lack the resources needed to transition 180 degrees almost overnight. So what's the journey you've personally experienced and what have you observed? Yeah, thanks, uh, Rob. Uh, look, it's, it was a very interesting one for us because we have a, a campus in, uh, well, it's in Tianjin, but it's just across the border from Beijing. So in many ways, we had a little bit of a head start because they went into uh, lockdown essentially in, in January and the students didn't come back after Chinese New Year to the school there. So our campus there with 900 students from year one to year 12 was already going through what it meant to have an online program. And that was also with um, uh, a significant percentage, two thirds of our international staff were offshore and couldn't get back to China. So had to deliver it from eight different countries where they were. And, and what came out of that was one that you could deliver it successfully, the academic component of the program, and there were different ways and different platforms that were used in China. But secondly, what came through very strongly, very quickly, were the issues of isolation and mental health and looking after the welfare of students, uh, you know, from, from their homes as well. So that was, that was our priority when we knew we were heading in this direction in, in uh, Australia and in Melbourne. And I guess we went a little bit harder, a little bit earlier at it in Melbourne because of the experience we had in China and because we assumed that, uh, I think a lot of people were thinking it might be a few weeks and we'll be back, but we, we always worked on the basis it was going to be at least 12 weeks, which is what it was um, in China and possibly longer. First priority was always around uh, the academic, what can we deliver for students, how can we do it, how can we keep the pace going and keep them learning across the school at the same uh, at the same pace as they would have been in the physical environment, but in the virtual environment. Secondly, uh, around that was then how do we support the staff? How do we really make sure that the staff are uh, up to speed on the tech? We knew we have got many great teachers. We knew we could deliver, um, deliver it, but they needed that support, the encouragement, the collaboration, and a lot of tech support to get to that point. And the third part of any decision making as a leader of a significant institution these days is you've got to be thinking long term too. What is, the, what is it actually for the survival of the institution? Because you, you can't take that for granted at the moment. Um, we have a look at many great uh, Australian and global institutions that have, many have collapsed and many are struggling. And you, you think of the struggles of the travel industry as examples. And, uh, and you cannot assume that this is gonna bounce back in a few weeks and you cannot assume that it's gonna bounce back to any sort of normal. And so therefore that planning around uh, your finances, your business continuity, what's the value proposition, all of those things are, you know, are being taken as, well, what's the short term, what's the medium term, what's the long term? And you're making judgments and decisions, a lot of them more than you ever would normally have as a leader, a lot of big decisions quickly with a, a limited amount of information and and with uh you know multiple scenarios that could play out over the next six nine twelve months so those those are the challenges around it all of the time coming back to what the core of any education institution is which is how do we deliver great education outcomes for the students for the pupils we have whether that's a school or a university so if we get that right if we can keep delivering strong outcomes that's our best chance of you know, at the harshest end to be survival as an institution. So that's what our, our leadership term. And in our case, as a school, simple motto that's always there for us. Every student matters every day. Everything drives that. And if you, if you make your decision making around that core values of what it is, then hopefully you come out with a, with a, with a sound process. And a lot of decisions made, we've got a lot right, we've got some wrong. You know, we, I went a bit harder on some of the aspects perhaps of survival with some of um, the people and employment elements early. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then there's been different phases. So we've gone from, uh, you know, before Easter in Melbourne, a really negative phase where it was rising. We were looking at being in lockdown for, for the full two terms, which the government kept telling us it would be. Then within about four or five days after Easter, that was, well, actually, it's getting better and it's looking good. And maybe we'll only be in lockdown. Why aren't we back at school? And then we get back to school after nine weeks, which was still longer than a lot of, a lot of states. Uh, and everyone's feeling very optimistic at the end of last term. And then within two weeks, that's now 
uh, you know, the fairly crushing blow in a kind of uh, mental sense for many people is, oh, we're going back into lockdown again, and that means going back into the virtual environment again. Mm -hmm. So it's all of those waves that you've got to manage in terms of people, staff, students, and how they're, and parents as well, and the whole community about how they're feeling about them. Yeah, I, I agree. And living in Melbourne, like yourself, um, there's a different atmosphere out there to, at the moment. It's um, very, there's a bit of a sombre mood around the place, I think, which wasn't there so much the first time around. Um, we spoke a few weeks ago to David Lloyd of UniSA um, that when the state border was beginning to close, they went into this major crisis management on a Sunday to plan for every contingency. In fact, I got an email from um, the head of international there who said it was the toughest day of her career. How did you respond? I mean, you've got all the parents, you've got all the families, you've got, I mean, no doubt you're being inundated by questions. How did you respond with the magnitude of the pandemic when it first became apparent? And what did you, what did you how did you prioritise? What, what did you prioritise? Well, well, the priority was delivery for students first and how we get that up and running and can do it efficiently. The welfare of staff and the support for staff to deliver that. And then, and then um, communications with our parent community as well. So pretty much since this started, uh, whenever there's been a changed element of it, as it has been frequently, we would be in daily communications with our parents uh, right. because the longer you leave it after a government announcement, the more parents feel uncertain. And, and it's sometimes that communication might be as simple as, well, nothing has changed. We're continuing on this path. We'll let you know further. Um, and, and the same with our staff. And then it's balancing that communications as to make sure you're not swamping people as well at the same time. So that's, that's been, you know, communications is the key um, through that. And it, it, look, it, it comes down to team, doesn't it? Whatever, you've got to have enough um, confidence in the team around you to build and to deliver on all the things that you've got. And as with so many businesses, I think the leadership team, uh, executive team at the school has been exceptional. Uh, in many ways, I'd say in my position as the CEO principal, you know, I, I've got a great team around me. I feel pretty fortunate on one sense that we have size and scale that we do because you, we have so many great people in the different areas to deliver on it. Gosh, I feel for, you know, principals running maybe a smaller school of 700 with a smaller team where they're at the coal face with the parents and having to do all that interaction with staff. You know, the, the, there's different scales to the job, but gee, they've got to cover every element of it. And in many ways, I think that's uh, that's a bit tougher than the, than what I've had to face with the support I have around me from our team. Yeah, it's a uh, I, I can imagine that uh, in in terms of the the strain on, on on those certain schools. And I'd like to sort of address that in terms of the the larger impacts on the school sector. I mean, we hear a lot about the impact of closed borders on universities, including projected financial losses and the consequences of no mid year international student intake. Mm. With regard to international students, what do you believe has been the major impacts on the school sector? I'm just focusing on the international education sector here, but uh, yeah, what do, you, what do you think has been the major impacts here? So obviously the, the uh, school sector is a much smaller part or is a smallish part, 7% of the total international sector in Australia. 20,000 international students in schools in Australia. 16,000 are onshore, 4,000 are still offshore. So for those onshore, uh, you know, obviously it's been arrangements around boarding and homestay and things that have changed and how, how that's gone. It's been the great difficulty of them deciding whether to go home for holidays, in which case they probably won't get back to Australia, or to stay in Australia and not see their families in a lot of cases. Um, in terms of it's different in each state, of course, but, you know, boarding houses have been significantly impacted. Most school boarding houses in Victoria, for example, closed. There were a couple that stayed open uh, and now are having to open under very different frameworks for, for operation than previously and, and how you meet the, the requirements, the health and safety requirements that are now in place for that is quite different. And then the other component of that is how we keep delivering for the 4,000 students, particularly those, the this, this significant group of that who are in their uh, year 12 certificates, how we deliver for them offshore. And, uh, and that, that for example, in Victoria's required a huge amount of negotiation federally and at state level to get all the various bodies, regulatory and authority bodies over the line to allow us because part of, your, part of our compliance requirements normally are that we're not allowed to deliver online offshore. Um, to, and, and we've got permission through to do that to the rest of this year. So I think that's been 
an important one for those students. It's also been an important one for the sector because, you know, if we get students halfway through their year 12 certificate and then they can't get back and can't deliver it and we're not supporting them offline and Australia-wide, then, you know, there's a huge blow to reputation to the Australian uh, Australian reputation for, for fair and safe uh, delivery of, of sort of certificate education. Um, the Victorian government has been fantastic with their support for our programs offshore where we have a, we have a, 120 students at our China campus who are in year 12 and uh, they have they sit a northern hemisphere timetable of VCE exams those exams weren't held this year in May about a third of those students have been given a, a, a VCE certificate based on their coursework and assessed through that which has been great and about two-thirds are going to stay with us for an extra six months in China to the end of the year and then sit the exams on the on the, the normal um, Australian timetable and that's required a lot of flexibility a lot of negotiation yeah. with yeah. government officials um, and they've been fantastic I think everyone has recognized the need in the international student sector to be flexible to be supportive of students to try and get positive outcomes uh, for students that leave pathways open for them when they finish school or allow them to continue with their university study that's really interesting to hear that the government can move so quickly so and so effectively in that way, but I'm just curious on what you what you just said. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess the, the challenges on in, on the international education sector and the students there are, are still with you. But if you if you double that with the issues related to the domestic students, do you think that some of these schools are going to have to close up permanently? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, so yeah, obviously, you know, government school sector. It faces its own challenges in different ways with the breadth of uh, the community that they've got to deliver to. In terms of the independent school sector, uh, I do expect that in Victoria, with the second wave that we're facing of the virus and the close down, that and the flow on impact onto the Victorian economy, uh, yes, I would be very surprised if there weren't uh, some schools that hit the wall in one way or another, whether they close or not or merge or how that works, you know, that um, I think there'll be a few that will be very tight on the margins through that. And it's a significant challenge for all schools. I think the majority of schools, independent schools, will be facing uh, probably, I think, you know, looking at maybe 10% um, drop in, in students for next year, and then that will be financially driven. I think when we look at the number of our families who are hitting, hitting hardship um, and, and, and for a lot of those schools that will push them very tight on the margins and it might depend on where they're at with their cycle of borrowing and other things as to how, how viable they are. So it's a challenging time and schools need to work hard to support their communities but you can't ignore the, the financial aspects of that on the business model of the school as well and, and, and uh, you know directors have obligations that they have to meet. So. Uh, I think it's a little bit different around Australia. Our Darwin campus, for example, hasn't been closed. So uh, it, it, we did some training for, to go on the virtual online program, but because Northern Territory had such a low uh, rate and then had a period of, I think, 48 days with nothing at all, they came back at the start of uh, term two and, con and uh, continued through and, and are back again now. But one of the things that comes out of Darwin, uh, for us, it highlights the there is a, a tech divide, if you like, and there's also, uh, I think, across Australia, we are seeing divisions in, in between those who can deliver, as we can, really effectively online virtual learning. And so many, you know, 10% of um, students in schools in Australia do not have access to technology at home, um, to the internet at home, and that's a significant factor. What we saw in Darwin, because of the lockdown of the Indigenous communities, we have uh, 80 borders, Indigenous borders from very remote communities who live at the school there, they had to go home uh, to, to stay in their communities or they wouldn't have got back. So they missed the most of last term of schooling and they are the students who, in a sense, are the most um, educationally disadvantaged in our community, the most behind to start with. And so there is just a very simple example of how I think, you know, we're all going to have to work hard coming out of this as educators to look at the way that we might use some of the positive things that we've got, learnings from technology, to go across to support the idea of, of remote, rural, regional communities and disadvantaged students, how we can lift them back up because, uh, you know, there is a significant percentage of, of 
this sort of coming generation who are going to find it hard to lift themselves back up out of this when we come out the other end. That's uh, it's a fascinating topic, and I think we could have a whole webinar just on the on the way that technology has disrupted the way that. Uh, uh, that, that some communities are better prepared to learn online and, and it's also, as you say, shown a, shown a big light on, on, on the areas that this, uh, that, that may not be able to get picked up at, mm. at, at the end of it. So, uh, but uh, we're just touching on well-being and, and we'll go back to international students briefly. The, the fact that overseas families can't travel to Australia and children must often experience fears and separation anxieties. What are the major issues that you've witnessed? And how can schools best respond to ensure the, the continued well-being of their of their international students? Yeah, it's a real, it's a good question. So one of the things I'm always uh, talking to our students about over all the broad scope of all of our students is how what an extraordinary group of students our international students are. And I ask always ask the students to think about what would it be like for you if you left your parents went overseas, studied in a second language in a different country and saw your parents once or twice a year. I mean, I think it's, it's hard for young people to necessarily take that in all the time and we've got to keep reinforcing that message so they appreciate um, just what an extraordinary job international students in schools and at universities do. And then it's the little things around that that we can do as well. It was interesting because the students who, schools in Australia, most uh, the students came back from schools uh, before school started, so that, that, you know most most students were back in Australia uh, because the lockdown didn't happen until uh, a bit after that. But um, a, 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 but they had to go into quarantine. So we, for example, as a school, we sent a care pack to all of our uh, international students at home at their home at their homestay. We don't we don't have boarding in Melbourne. They're all homestay, uh, and that was hugely appreciated. Just the notion that we were thinking of them and coming back. They were even at that point able to zoom into their classes, which was good. And then we made sure that the students, uh, when they came back into the classroom two weeks later, uh, that they were given a, a sense of appreciation from the other students. So the messaging was, well, they are, you know, doing the quarantine to help us to, to try and, uh, you know, get through this, um, avoid the virus as well, which obviously couldn't happen. And I guess the, the best story I heard out of that were a couple of students who went into their classroom and were cheered back into their classroom for the first time. And the lift in spirit for international students was huge around that. So there's big things we can do, but there's a lot of little things. And those little things are often at the people to people level, um, you know, making them feel supported, encouraging them to feel supported, encouraging the broader interaction with a wide range of students and, um, and, and continuing to emphasise the notion of how important they are uh, to the whole community. I think most schools do that really well. Uh, and it's because of the scale. It's more challenging, isn't it, at the university level. The scale of the number of international students in schools means that you, you know, school leadership can work really hard to get that in, in get cross-cultural engagement and get the, reap the benefits on both sides of that. But we certainly recognise that's more challenging with the scale of, uh, you know, international students at our universities. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's really, there's so many comments I want to make around what you've said and um, yeah, I really appreciate what you're saying about the flexibility of um, and the government agencies and so on about the online. Isn't it interesting, I don't know if you, well you probably are on top of it now, the CNN and BBC coverage about America now wanting, threatening to not accept students or making them go home if it's all online. Um, yeah. Complete, yeah. Complete reversal of where we're at at the moment here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and look, and that, that's the, the interesting question around what's the future for, you know, where we're heading with um, international student recruitment, of course, uh, and, and it's a great pity that it's all been slowed down by the second wave of the virus in Victoria. But, you know, America, as we know, is, is on the nose and, and uh, depending on what happens at the upcoming election, of course, so, so it's, it's not a most attractive destination. Canada's got its problems because... Uh, of course, there are, there are provinces of Canada that have been really hardly hit by, very severely hit by the virus as well. The UK similarly. So I think it, all of the popular destination countries with the possible exception of New Zealand have got really serious challenges around it. Um, our challenge on that at the moment is of course, with where we are at with the virus, we might be the last to start back up. And that, that puts us at a bit of a, a disadvantage in terms of turning international students in our recruitment. But I'd be pretty confident we will, we're not, in the long run, we're not going to lose a lot of what is our um, popularity and, and market share. It's just a matter of, uh, of, of, you know, 
how institutions in education survive through the next, I think the next 18 months and then how we can bounce back after that. Yeah, yeah. Derek, I'll just stop you there because there, there is a poll going on uh, at the moment right here. We've, um, and, and one of the, f the first question is, do you think under, eight, uh, under 18 international students will come back to Australia in January, February? Uh, the majority, 51% say unlikely. So our audience don't, don't, don't necessarily feel uh, optimistic that, uh, that, that there'll be a return to normal from, from January. Sorry, Rob, you go. Well, that highlights actually where I'm going to come because Derek, you were talking about recruitment. Well, you know, it's almost impossible to keep engaged. And I know in talking to other sectors, it's engagement. How, how have you managed to keep, keep that engagement going? Because, you know, you can't have that in-country presence. You can't go to events. You can't, you know, you can do it online, but it's not the same as physically being there. Mm. How, how yeah. Um, so, well, obviously, we've, we've got 10 different programs in China. We've got the campus in Tianjin, which is our, our flagship, if you like, with, uh, with 900 students there. Uh, and then we've got, uh, we've got another Misha Academy by Halebury in southern China and then eight other partner schools. So we've been, you know, our staff have been deeply engaged with all our partner schools, providing them with a lot of support for the delivery of their VCE programs while they've been um, in lockdown. And, and uh, that's been good. So... It, it is that people-to-people -people relationship that's been going well there. I found it really interesting at a board level. Um, you know, I chair the board of our joint venture company and the school in China. And the board consists of, uh, of, of two of our representatives from Halebury here, another uh, Australian Chinese uh, partner of ours, and then the board members, the other board members are from our Chinese joint venture partner. And, uh, you know, I'm used to uh, flying there every uh, six weeks and doing a full day board meeting there with those partners. Now we switch, we've switched into fortnightly board meetings on a Friday night with our, via Zoom with our Chinese partners. And it's been a totally different dynamic. It's been really interesting. Um, there's been a lot of positives out of it. I think, I think everyone is feeling very much uh, connected and aligned with what the vision and mission of what we're trying to achieve there is. So I've really enjoyed the, the more regular interaction. Um, uh, but at the same time, you miss some of the deeper engagement and some of the one-to-one -one conversations that you have when you're doing a full-day board meeting over morning tea or lunch or when we, you know, go out later. So there's, there's different elements to it. But it's also been interesting to see, you know, in the initial phase of that, you could see that our Chinese partners, who most of whom were locked down in their apartments in Beijing, you know, you could see the strain and the stress that was on them, and then that switched, <laughs> in a sense, reverse. They were they were opening back up, and then we were we were you know stuck in our our homes uh, in Melbourne. So it's been it's been a kind of a shared a shared experience, um, and I think we feel in many ways uh, more strongly connected through it than we might have otherwise. So that's been a positive. Plus, we have our team on the ground in in China, and I have to say the leadership of uh, of our Peter Rogerson, who's our principal there, has just been uh, extraordinary. Uh, and, and, you know, I can't, they have been, in a sense, not outside of, of the village where the school is uh, since January and running the school and sometimes running it with students back, sometimes running it online and coordinating, you know, the 300 staff that we have there. So, uh, you know, I've been, again, very fortunate that... Uh, Peter Rogers and Yanni Galanis, the team that I've got in charge over there on, from our side, plus the extraordinary skills of our Chinese partners um, have just been outstanding. And that's, that's been really interesting to have a very close connection with at the people to people level with Chinese partners when a whole lot of things are happening at the political level, which are about, you know, tension and broken relationships and everything like that. And I think that's what we've all got to do, isn't it? As businesses and institutions, keep working at that at that level with the people we, we're building relationships with, with the people we learn to trust. And, you know, we, we'll get through under the political tensions, if you like, if we keep building those relationships as strongly as we can. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, I need to change tack a little bit. There's one thing I want to focus on about, um, and I think it's been exaggerated because of, we've now got the Queensland borders opening up now, and yet we've got, we're in shutdown here, lockdown in Victoria, uh, or Melbourne at least. So we, we've, got, we've got a kind of a, a mixed bag across the country. And so we've got, we, we've seen, you, we, we had it here for a while, the gradual return of students to schools, now it's stopped. Other, other states are not having the same issues. 
Um, there's, I guess there's always the underlying risk though. One positive test can bring a whole school to an abrupt halt. It mm. means disruption for students, it brings disruption for teachers and families. How does a school cater for that? Do you have these contingency plans in place for the onslaught challenges which might emerge with just even one negative result? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we've, we've, you know, we've developed contingency plans for all of our different scenarios. So, and some of those for us in Melbourne, you know, we've got four campuses in Melbourne and on a Tuesday and a Thursday, the students from all of those campuses from year 10 to 12 come to the one site to participate in sport and other things. That's not happening. We've kept, we've been campus specific to break that down. Um, uh, but, but, uh, and, you know, we're all very wary. So coming back to school on Tuesday, all of our students will be temperature tested as they come in. So it's 10s to 12s coming back in Victoria. Everyone from prep to year nine will be staying at virtual learning for next week. And there'll be, you know, we're still waiting for further government advice on what it means after that. Um, so, uh, you know, the temperature testing, all of the isolation components that we have, anyone, you know, we, we will be providing access to students if they're not well staying from home to zoom into their classes so all of these things a lot of things on technology that are really interesting and that would have you know we might have taken been had in the planning for the next two to two and a half years and we've brought them all forward and done them in two months which is great but you know and it's going to open up other opportunities for education once we get through this but the logistical challenges of running schools at the moment with some students back on site mm. most of them not are certainly significant uh, and of course, in different states, you know, there's different scenarios. There's been some, there's some really interesting things done in New South Wales by some of the schools there as to, as to how they juggled that scenario when they were partly in lockdown. But, uh, you know, uh, the second phase in Victoria is going to be much harder, uh, even though we're much more familiar with all the technology. And it's going to be harder because, as you said earlier, Rob, there's a, there's a sense of a bit of a doom around the place a bit of gloom and around, you know, Melbourne generally. And so people are coming into this second phase of virtual learn, online learning in schools uh, with, a, with a pretty deflated sort of uh, sense of, of where COVID-19 is taking them. So we've got to be really aware of what that means for, for mental health, for looking after staff, for looking after parents, parents as well as the students and for supporting everyone through it. And when yeah, we, we spoke, you made a comment, um, which I think is, I thought was very important, about how this has almost accelerated things we were going to do in the long term, and now it's accelerated it. And we had a positive energy, and let's just hope it continues. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's what we, you know, that's what school leaders, that's what we need to do. We need to be encouraging, enthusing our people to work through it. We need to be making adjustments. Uh, depending on that mood. So we, we do uh, fortnightly surveys of our parents to assess how they're feeling about things. And, and each fortnight, we'll then make some adjustments depending on what the, what the general feedback and mood is to, to the program. Um, and the technology side, we've, you know, we're really excited about the technology. But, and there's this fascinating tension that's come out of this, which is uh, that we know we can deliver the virtual online experience academically and that students uh, maybe not at the very young very very young levels but students can uh, develop their academic skills and program at the same pace all of the testing when our students came back after nine weeks was that they were uh, in many cases slightly ahead of the point they would have been if they'd been in the virtual classroom but at the same time as that the experience from uh, the students and the staff generally was they craved the human interaction and and the notion of, you know, how that would, uh, you know, friendships, but also the interaction with teachers. And of course, that development of the, of the people skills that are so important, the collaboration, the teamwork, the people skills, requires that subtle, nuanced human interaction that schools deliver and the great teachers deliver so well face to face. So how do we balance those two things out in a future of education? Um, and I think there's some exciting opportunities um, through this. So I think that tension will lead us relatively quickly to some new frameworks for, for school education, uh, certainly secondary school education. Yeah, and I guess it will be considered a new normal when it's not con not considered online learning anymore, it's just considered learning. Like it's, it's just part and parcel of what it is. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and you know, it's the language we've been using. We've been always really careful to say school 
shut down and the, and the classrooms aren't we just using virtual classrooms you know as yeah. distinct from classrooms so we've tried to you know the, the initial phrase that a lot of people were using was remote learning we we didn't want any bar of the word remote because the language is important. You know, you're either in a classroom or you're in a virtual classroom. You're going to be learning your academic program and there's, you're going at the same pace, whatever it is. It's still a, a classroom. Hmm. I think, I think the, the future generations will look back at the way we separated the terms and they won't understand why we separated online, on campus, like remote. They just go, look, That's right. it's, it's going to be interesting. We do have yeah. a lot of uh, comments here. Uh, we have Kira Lee Hughes, who works at a school based in Singapore. Uh, I, I'd like to understand uh, what online learning might look like in the school sector in the future. Is this a service uh, that is viable? Uh, it wasn't necessarily viable before COVID-19. And I, and I guess in, the, in addition to that, how do you reassure the, the students and their parents that they're still getting a good, good school experience? That's right. Well, I, I actually think it, coming out the other side of this, the notion of the, what I was talking about before, the human development, the people-to-people -people development that's done through a great co-curricular, extracurricular program, drama, theatre, sport, all of those sort of things is going to become even more important because there is clearly a craving for that as it's not so fully a part of the program now. In terms of what that means, uh, you know, if, we, if we're thinking of traditional schools and the pathway through and most students going through school and then finishing up with the year 12 equivalent certificate, whatever country they're in and coming out that in, the experience that we have from the, the, the blended learning that you like or the development that we'll be able to have of blended learning out of that, the virtual classroom, the online experience means that, you know, here's our core that we have to deliver. We're going to try and deliver that smarter and better and in less time and free up that time for the broader notion of the, the experiential learning, the human development, the idea, the, the, the idea uh, that students can follow a passion more, that teachers can follow a passion more. The system is always gonna work a little bit behind or a long way behind in some cases, what the education outcomes are that you want for your students, what you might believe is the optimal delivery of education. So I think we can squeeze our delivery to be smarter and better within the system and then free up that time for the broader development that are gonna lead students to be ready for this rapidly changing face of work um, in, the, in you know, what's coming in the, the decade ahead or in the year ahead as well as the decade ahead. The other part of that will be, so that's for us you know, as, as a, a well-resourced school that's got parents who are really committed to the education of their kids and, and we can do all of that. The other question of that is how can we take our learnings from technology as a school, but as a sector as well, and how can we then use that to lift uh, or to, to, to break down some of the inequality that's there in our system? So there's a lot of things I think that we can use to, uh, which will help overcome a distance and will help overcome disadvantage that come out of our use of technology. And I think that's going to be a really important part of it. Um, so that's system-wide, but then also what you're seeing is some really interesting things emerging, the virtual online schools. America, of course, has a huge group of parents who homeschool, and you know the, there's a number of new startups that are coming up through there which are about going to school one day a week. So that's for the homeschool market, but you get this really interesting uh, virtual experience one day a week where your, stu where your homeschooled students are engaging. We don't have that in, a, in Australia so much, but I think there's a whole range of other programs that we're gonna be able to add to our students at whatever level that they're at, where they're really gonna be able to follow a passion. And I think that's exciting. It's lovely to hear that, 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 the, that, you, that you view online learning not so much as a, a time saver, but as a sort of a, a liberating uh, uh, kind of instrument that really uh, brings in more time to do the things you actually do that do add that sort of human touch, which is a, a nice sentiment. We do have Janelle Chapman here who has said, uh, agree entirely about the comment about not using remote learning. Janelle, as you know, was on the webinar last week. We talked about VET. Uh, thanks for that, Janelle. Um, we did have another question here about the, since Google Classroom is not accessible in China, which online platform do you use? Yeah, we, we ended up using a multiple range of platforms in China because of that. Um, uh, and uh, you know, uh, but that was my Chinese team, so okay. <laughs> I don't have complete ignorance on that. But they got oh, it done. Uh, no we still, interestingly, Zoom's been sort of uh, cancelled in China as well, unless you have a VPN. So um, 
uh, that that represents another challenge as to how we might run meetings and other things there as well. All right. Well, we'll move along. I'm, I would like to get to the boarding house because a lot of the people who are tuning in today are from schools and they do have boarding houses that have been affected. And then, as you know, we talked about before, international school students are mostly living in boarding houses and homestays. Boarding houses can be effectively quarantined, but the homestay sector is an altogether a different kind of issue. A lot of these, a lot of these hosts are a bit fearful about the risk of transmission. How well do you believe the homestay sector in general has responded versus boarding houses? Yeah, look, I think uh, in many ways, certainly from our own experience, our homestays have been fantastic. And as I ask around school, other schools, it's generally been a pretty positive experience. I think, you know, that there is a there is a fee for doing the homestay as well. And I think people are appreciative of that revenue stream as well at this point in time, uh, as well as doing it, you know, most people doing a great job of looking after the students. I actually think the challenge is more in the boarding houses at the moment, particularly in Victoria, as we come back in this spread of virus. And there are extraordinarily stringent conditions around boarding houses, around how they can operate. And, uh, you know, the notion of a breakout of the, the virus in a boarding house, which I don't think has happened yet in, in an Australian school is really troubling. And um, I think of my colleagues down at Geelong Grammar, a very fine school, of course, with the largest, I think it's the largest boarding house in Australia, you know, with seven or 800 students there on site in boarding. And that's a massive challenge for them as to how they're going to uh, meet the health component. So I think homestay, I think homestay will be okay. And I think, you know, most of our um, homestay families will want to keep doing it. And I think that the bigger challenge, of course, is going to be at what point and how do we return students to Australia, international students or get them coming back into Australia. And that's a much bigger challenge, I think, than what we, uh, than the actual operational component once we've got them back in the schools. Which that, that's interesting because obviously um, we've just seen the, it looks like the pilots aren't going to be happening in Adelaide and Canberra now. So, um, and you know, you wonder how much of that is, is, is community fears and obviously parents and no shortage of asking you questions about, often based around their own fears. What, what are you seeing in the types of issues um, and questions that are being asked? What, what, where are the concerns lying? Because deep down, every parent will have fears and concerns about schooling. Mm. Well, I think the pilots are more, you know, at the Australian government end deciding not to. And obviously, I, I sit on the International Education Council and there was the Global Reputation Task Force that was running a weekly meeting to cover a part of that. The pilots were being, you know, put together for as long as uh, two months ago and were certainly ready to go. But it's that second wave in Victoria that's, that's prevented that happening. Um, and, and I think... You know, the, the fears, I, I think, of international students, I think there's, there's two things that have come, come through that. I think that will recede because every country has been through this. Mm -hmm. um, and so, therefore, it, it's kind of, it's not, it's not country specific. Um, I mean, it was interesting that the Global Reputation Task Force, the minister, set that up in January to respond to the bushfires. <laughs> to improve. Within a week, it had switched from the bushfires to, uh, to looking at the pandemic scenario. So I don't think that's an issue. I think one of the issues on the international student front is going to be, uh, if you look at our biggest markets, in particular China and the Chinese economy and what's going to be the flow on impact on that for, for communities, of parents to be actually able to afford to support their children going offshore. You know, 1.2 million Chinese students currently studying offshore. Is that figure sustainable with the where the Chinese economy might be going? And, and I think we we're all unsure on, on what that means. Um, and then what does it mean in terms of the way families are feeling both uh, financially and also in a, um, uh, in a health and welfare sense? And we've already seen that exponential growth in schools over the last decade in, uh, in, throughout Asia of international English language schools. We've already seen a growth in the number of uh, parents who want to send their students to an international school close to home where they can be home on the weekend rather than to a country offshore where, where they can't, and uh, will that lead to further growth in that sector as well? I think those are some of the questions that are flying around at, at the moment for the school sector and for the university sector as well. Yeah, it's a, I mean, I'll just end the poll now, by the way. We've got some really interesting uh, feedback coming here. I'll share the results with you all right now. Uh, we do have... Um, well, the, the, the figure for question one has remained 51% of our attendees think that, that, that it's unlikely 
uh, that, that international students under 18 will return in January, February. Uh, it's very split for question two. Do you think families will, more families will choose boarding schools because of the contained environment? 38 versus 40, 34%, likely versus unlikely. Interesting split there. Uh, question three, do you believe homestay hosts will become more reluctant to become hosts due to community fears? 66%, uh, large majority there, believe they will be likely uh, to be more reluctant. And do you think under 18s will take up online learning in great numbers? 43 actually don't, don't think so. They think it's unlikely versus 36% think likely. So that's a, that is an interesting split there. Uh, I guess under 18 online learning is a different kind of uh, situation to, to, to undergraduate and, and tertiary and vet and things like that because it uh, does require a bit more. But as we've discussed, you know, it's being, it's being evolved and there's, there's things happening in there. Um, but I do want to talk about, you know, we talked about what's happening in China a little bit. And I know that Halebury Hale, has a large network of campuses, not only in Australia and, and including Darwin, but also in China. And each of these campuses will have faced different types of challenges and dynamics based around their respective locations. So how have you been managed? How, how have you done this? How, how have you been able to maintain unity and you know, just structure at a time when all these different rules and restrictions are going around? And what challenges have you faced? Yeah, so uh, I guess the, the, the unity has come through, you know, the fact that everyone is experiencing something similar. <laughs> um, and I guess, uh, you know, uh, and I don't, I, I'm sure you, many of you have heard this, but it was the notion of, you know, we're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats, wasn't it? It was the phrase that I've heard used. And I like that one because the boats have all been a bit different. The Darwin boat's been on pretty calm waters and it's been a bit choppier in Melbourne and it's been pretty rough at times in China as well. So uh, at different times we've swung you know, different groups of people that we have and teams at the school to support the operations in different ways. So we've been really strong in ramping up our online support for the delivery of the BCE for our partner schools in China. Uh, we've been, you know, I, I've been in daily meetings with our leadership and team in, in Tianjin just to make sure that they feel okay, they feel connected, that they're a part of the, the broader community. As I said, we ramped up our board meetings to have them fortnightly to keep everyone connected as we've gone through. So, um, you know, w the, the great thing about it is you're all connected by one thing and that is by education. And when you're in school education, the one thing you want, and, and that is you want to deliver strong outcomes for your students. So having that sort of unifying education mission is just a really important part of connecting everyone around the world. And students and families are not that different, whether they're based in Beijing or Tianjin or Guangzhou or Darwin or Melbourne. It's, it's, it's a family, it's people, it's a community, and it's strong education outcomes, academic and social outcomes that we work together on. Um, Derek, I, I'd live within the Keysborough catchment, um, so to speak, so I've witnessed the phenomenal growth you've experienced over the years, domestically and internationally. Um, the brand has become absolutely exemplary. It's, it's, a, it's a world best practice brand. But obviously this is going to impact growth, and I, I just would like to unpack the question of growth a little bit. Um, you know, is growth about revenue or is growth about regional? Well, how does regional growth? Because um, you know, when we spoke previously, you might find some regional um, university, uh, schools in regional settings like Ballarat, Indigo, etc., might struggle. And then we've also got this um, catering for disadvantaged people, and you know, maybe that's good, that can impact. So, will is it possible to still keep balanced rates of growth? Is it possible to balance domestic, international, regional, city advantage, disadvantaged, etc.? Yeah, so fr from our point of view, uh, it, it, I mean, it's got to come back. You've got to have a clear mission and a clear vision, don't you? And ours, uh, which we, we took up 10 years ago, was to be recognised as a great world school, which is, it's in one way sounds a bit odd, but it's the notion of world connectedness. How do we, you know, get... And the, the recognition part is a really important part of that because you're never going to achieve that. It's always up to someone else's interpretation. So it's, it's aspirational. And that's what we like about our broad communities. They are aspirational communities and that's what we want to continue to feed through. So with a broad mission like that, the notion of growth comes um, in a way that you can see fitting into it. So, you know, our growth in, in, in China was a part of 
you know, wanting to be a broad world school and connecting and having a footprint on the ground and doing it that way. And then it, it grew naturally out of that into Darwin, where, you know, we see there's a strong connection there with obviously what we're doing with Melbourne, but also with linking into the countries just to the north of Australia. And, and I think, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, potential for our education to link more strongly with Indonesia and with Malaysia and with the Philippines. And we've got a program in the Philippines and well, and we've got a program in Timor-Leste as well. So uh, for us, it, it'll be a natural, you know, we will continue to look for opportunities because again, if you are an entre if you have an entrepreneurial outlook, if you want that in your students, we've always said you want to be that as a school. And so we will continue to have that outlook as a school and assess opportunities as they arrive. Mm. Um, in terms of growth in student markets in Australia, well, uh, you know, it's going to be more challenging. I think, you know, the, the, the predictions, for example, of Melbourne's population and the growth through to 2030 and then through to 2050, will they change coming out of this? Will, will the view of Melbourne be actually, you know, we need to be a smaller, tighter city. We don't need that level of growth. It presents its own challenges. So is there going to be a reframing of what that looks like for Melbourne and possibly for Sydney as well? That's unknown. Um, at the moment. So I think there's, there's interesting challenges. And on the international student market, I don't know, I think international student mobility will continue to be really strong. Um, I think there's been, obviously, for the last few years, everyone has been trying to look at the way of diversifying Australia's engagement with different countries. We have, you know, 40% uh, of our market from China, which you've got to do. You've got to go to the biggest market if you want to have it. But the question might be or really is what's our engagement um, near there and then the other part of growth is around how does it fit into a broader mission of doing good international education and like we've done in East Timor where we see it as very much a social justice agenda we've got something that we can deliver there we can support families through there we can get some interesting outcomes on a small scale but some great outcomes for, for Timor East students who wouldn't have otherwise perhaps graduated with a year 12 certificate and wouldn't have otherwise got to university. Yeah. It's a inter very interesting time about, uh, about what the, what the future will hold. And uh, I mean, uh, look, there's, uh, there's, no one can really predict how the current machin the different machinations will pan out. Many universities are experiencing increased applications. Mm. There's been a talk of a significant return to enrollments in 2021, 20, 2022, when deferrals and delayed pathway students join with new commencing students. Uh, I guess, you know, we talked to IDP Connect a few weeks ago and they were talking about this pent up demand of students who are, who are, ready, who are ready to go. That's right now. That doesn't take into account, you know, whether or not the economic circumstances in those countries might, might cause a, a, a decrease of that demand later. But I guess if we can sort of, crystal ball a little bit how do you see this unfolding for the schools i mean what's the what's the roadmap to recovery and just what do you think is going to happen next <laughs> <laughs> well the the big question the, the, there's multiple questions in planning because you know i was chatting to one of my uh colleagues who's a principal who i whose view i greatly value last night we're saying what what if essentially what we're seeing now continues for the next 18 months to two years. What does that mean? What does that mean for us in terms of what we can deliver as a school? What's the value proposition for, for you know, independent schools on that? Or, you know, if the vaccine pops up quicker than that and, it's, and we're all through it in six months, what does that mean? So it's kind of hard. You can't be, I think what it says for schools is you have to be flexible. You have to be nimble. You have to invest in technology. You have to be prepared to deliver in different modes. And you've got to be thinking ahead as to what they might look like. So, you know, we've got all of our 10 to 12 students back next week, but not our prep to year nines. We've just upped our investment in, as an example, multiple technologies relating to Zoom, including, um, you know, iPad swivels. So that because I anticipate when our students come back at the other end of that, there'll be, you know, we'll have many, many classes where there might be 15 students at school and five at home because some of them will be isolating and some of them, will might have health issues and that so the next phase of our online which is our next um uh, we, which we don't know how long it is at this stage it could only be a week or you know it might be six weeks um, might be longer that phase is going to be delivering for the students then but preparing for what is likely to be a different teaching and learning scenario then that flows into the whole notion of blended learning and what that looks like as well for the future. If we have positive experiences out of that, if we know we can deliver it, it creates a whole new framework to come forward. 
out of that. And, and whilst most schools in Australia are single campus, that then opens up our notion of how do we more connect the academic program across all of our campuses in Australia and in China so they can all be a part of the, the, same, um, the same notion. And then, you know, there's really interesting discussions that come out of that. You can produce fabulous online material we were used to talk about a master teacher delivering some of that, but maybe it's not a master teacher because maybe that material is produced and actually done in avatar form, if you like, mm. as, the, as the lecture component of what, you know, core education, uh, some of the core content might be, and then you break it down into smaller tutorials face-to-face -face for the human engagement that we were talking about. So these are all really fascinating opportunities for the future. But it is, uh, it's flexibility, it's being nimble, it's being quick, it's always thinking of how do we support the students, the families and the staff to deliver this and the future is, is, is unclear but there's going to be really interesting opportunities out of it as well. Yeah, I guess it's, uh, I guess it's one of those, um, in some ways it's a real hindrance, in other ways it, in other ways it will democratise education because you can all of a sudden increase your customer base massively by scaling through technology. But I don't want to underestimate the barriers. Do you have any thoughts on the sort of barriers that you're going to face or some of the schools around Australia and the world are going to have to face to, to make this transition who perhaps may not have the resources of, uh, of Halebury? Well, there's some really interesting, as I said, online platforms coming up. We are, a, you know, we're on the process of launching our virtual, our virtual teaching program and the idea of that, that that will be available to anyone and we want to get that up to, you know, VCE certificate level, um, wherever they are. And so through that, you have access to, you know, great teachers who can deliver that content through there. Um, how accessible, what, what are the fees around that? At the high end of that, you've got the Avenue School in New York who's starting to deliver some very interesting high-end virtual experiences. And you've got a number of programs there that are pretty low end, but doing some interesting things for students as well. So I think it is, I, I like the phrase, the democratization of education. I think it does open things up as to how we can um, spread great teaching, but the challenge still around that will be, how do you build in that, that deeper human element that we've been talking about for, for students right across the spectrum um, as well. But I do think it opens things up for our education systems as well. And and for our leaders in, in you know, government delivery education as to, how, uh, as to how we can deliver more equitably across the, the broad range of students that we have in the schools. Rob, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I, I, I just have got one, one comment. I think people will adapt very willingly. Um, I think they're learning to adapt and they take a different approach. The under, um, underlying principle though is that education is a very high values based purchase. So people won't give up on that. And it's still a very important measure in so many markets and evolving markets. You know, we, we talked about the countries immediately to our north. Education is going to become even greater demand in my view, but it's just we have to adapt the technology. We could use this as the best catalyst for change possible in one sense. We can skip a generation in our delivery. Brilliant. Well, Derek, thank you very much for your time. And uh, we, I think that was a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, James. Thank you, Rob. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, thank you very much for joining as well, personally. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We've had a, uh, a fascinating discussion here today. These, these, are the, uh, these, these webinars are available on our website, insiderguides.com.au forward slash webinars. Uh, we'll send all of you who attended today an, an email with the recording. Uh, sorry, I didn't get to all of your questions. I did try to uh, bring them together and ask them in our already prepared questions. It's never easy, uh, but uh, thank you again for all joining us. We'll be back, uh, not next week. We're running this international, uh, we're running the Council of International Students Conference at Insider Guide next week. So we're, we're busy with our Zoom account next week, but the week after that, uh, we'll, Rob and I will be, we'll, we'll be back. Um, but thank you again so much, and we'll speak to you all soon. And thanks again, Derek. Thank you. Cheers. See you guys. Thanks so much. See ya. Bye. Yeah.